Hello and welcome to Healing from Within. I am your host, Cheryl Glick, author of The Living Spirit, Answers for Healing and Infinite Love. And today I welcome Professor Anaso Imoajin, author of Beyond Expectations, which shares a look at the multifaceted identities of second-generation Nigerian adults in the United States and Britain and uh, shows us an understanding of the challenges of African immigrants and African Americans. Hello, uh, Anaso, and thank you for joining us on Healing From Within today. Thank you, Cheryl, for having me on. And so as listeners of the show have come to expect, my guests and I share our intimate experiences and observations into self-investigation and trying to understand the nuances of our physical and spiritual essence so we may face challenges in more effective, satisfying ways for better results and the improvement of health, prosperity, well-being, and better interactions between people. In today's episode of Healing from Within, Professor Anaso Imawajin shows us how she believes that Nigerian adults conceive of an alternative notion of black identity that differs radically from African American and black Caribbean notions of black in the United States and Britain. We may come to understand how race, ethnicity, and class shape identity and how globalization, transnationalism, and national context inform sense of self. Anna, so I always love to ask my guests to think back to their childhood and remember a person, place, event, or an interest that may have already shown them or others what might be important to them in their adult life's work and lifestyle. Because I believe that within the heart and soul of the child lies the destiny or life plan and their future. So think back for a minute. I, yes, that's actually a very powerful statement you just made. Um, thinking about what you asked, I remember... Um, when I was young, in 1981, my father was my father is a professor, and so he was um, a visiting scholar at the University of Delaware in 1981. And then I was very young, and my parents wanted to put me in into preschool. They wanted me to go to kindergarten or just go to a play group to have children of my own age to play with because my sisters were older than me and they had gone to elementary school in, in Delaware. We were in real, we were in, we were in real mountain, I believe, and so my mom and I we went round the neighborhood to all the different preschool buildings and all the different nursery schools, and they refused to accept me in. In many places, we would knock on the door, and they wouldn't open the door. We would see them switch the curtain and look out, and they see two black people, and they refused to 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 open the door. And so I kept on going back home day after day, crying to my dad and my mom that they refused to open the door for me. And it was just a powerful lesson because at that time it was, you know, it was we sort of interpreted it as it was because of racism that they did. We were in a very white neighborhood, and my sisters were having a tough time in school. And so I had to stay home with my mom while she was teaching me nursery rhymes. And that has been a powerful. Um, story and, and it made, made a lasting impression on me and my I, family. Yes, I'm sure it did. And and when you're talking about that, I remember when I was 15 and I was in camp. Also, uh, this was in uh, Pennsylvania, actually. Uh, my parents came to take us me out for dinner to visit on camp day, and we went to a restaurant, and the restaurant was empty. And the man said, uh, we're fully booked. There are no tables for you. And I took my dad's arm and I said, what what is this? I don't understand. And uh, we're Jewish. And um, it was the same same story. And 
another time when my son was doing commercials in the city on an audition, he uh, walked in and the woman said, who sent this child here? He doesn't, he's not a towhead, meaning a towhead is a blonde person. And oh, my son said, turned to me, he was about, oh, five years old. And he said to me, don't they want me here? Well, let's leave and I'm never coming back again. So uh, many of us have experienced this insensitivity and this lack yeah. of regard and respect for human dignity. And for me, yeah. at, this, at this stage of my life, for me to think that it still exists in a time where we have so much, so much information, so much technology, uh, we should be able to understand that we're one humanity. We're one energy right. form. We're one soul life. We, we, well, I, I'm an intuitive medium. I, I deal with healing work and healing energies, so I understand this. But so many people are still in mm -hmm. their egos and their mindsets and their misbeliefs, and it's, it's changing. It really is changing, uh, but I cannot yeah. still understand how it, it's not completely the way it should already be. This separatism... Mm -hmm is not good for, for anybody against any race, religion, culture, gender. And uh, we have to talk about these things like you and I are doing right now. Uh, but go on yeah. to tell us your road to being a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Right. And I guess I wanted to connect that story, why I shared the story of my past in the early 1980s, but just to show that, you know, things have changed in the United States and have improved from the time when I was refused admission into the, the nursery school, because look at me now, I'm a professor here at the University of Pennsylvania. So I just shared that story to show how, you know, things don't remain the same and we have made much progress. And yes, and so, we have. Um, yes. yes. Thankfully, um, yes, we have. We yes. I'm, I'm a Nigerian. I'm, I'm a Nigerian immigrant. I'm from Nigeria. So I did my bachelor's in sociology at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. And from there, I worked for a while with Procter & Gamble. I was in sales, selling Pampers and Pringles in the open market. And then I decided I wanted to do a master's. So I went to England to University of Cambridge to do a master's. And from there, I came to the United States where I, I taught in a community college for a year, and then I got admission to do my PhD at Harvard in sociology. And so upon finishing my PhD in sociology where I looked at um, the children of Nigerian immigrants, what has become the book now that you're interviewing me about, I, I became an assistant professor. I went for a job interview, and I was um, given the job here at Penn. Where I'm an assistant professor of sociology in the areas of race and ethnicity and immigration. So that's my story, a very brief, short story. Excellent. But let's show our listeners some of the differences between first and second generation African immigrants and African Americans who were born here. And uh, their perceptions of each other are very different. So uh, let's give our listeners a feeling for that. Okay. I, I think that was the thing that surprised me, one of the surprising findings as I did my project and I was talking to all these adult children of Nigerian immigrants because regardless of where they came from, whether they grew up in on the eastern seaboard or they grew up in Texas or they grew up in the Midwest, they all had stories because I did ask them in the course of the interview to describe their relationships with African Americans. To me, I asked them, you know, how did you fit in in your neighborhood? Did you fit in or did you feel that you were treated as a stranger? Talk to me about your experiences in school. And all of them all talked about the tough time they had with Afri their African American peers, you know. And all of them told me stories about how their African American peers kept on telling them, go back to your jungle. You might be black, you, you might, but you're not one of us. You're not, you're a different kind of black. You know, a lot of them talked about being charged people, black African American peers, calling them African booty scratcher, which is an ethnic slur, basically saying you know they are monkeys, they scratch their butts, 
yeah, from the oh, jungle. Oh, how... How sad to hear that about people who all came from basically from Africa once upon a time. Know. Uh, you know, when, know, if a white person would say that, they would say racist. But if a black person says that to another black person, and by the way, is that the correct term to use black, or should I be using African American or African immigrant? Would that be better? Black is fine. No, black is fine. They do not contest. None of my respondents contest being black. They okay. are phenotypes. Well, let's get on to this. But what you were just pointing out is that there is a very big difference between the African uh, Americans born here. Many of them from, from their uh, ancestry uh, were descendants of slaves, and slavery being a brutal and vicious cycle uh, has continued to, today to haunt the African-American culture, and that's why I think uh, we can't get past this racism because they have not been able to let it go, and there's still anger about the past. Living in the past does nobody any good because it's just a memory. The future is here. We must go forward into creating something new and much more viable and wonderful for all of us. So that's a big difference. Now, you did say in the book that African immigrants from Nigeria have had a different relationship with white people and they come here, or Caucasian, whatever term we use, uh, it's really not negative, it's just, you know, language from the past perhaps, but it's okay. And, and, and they, they have come for economic reasons, for education, uh, to uh, be part of a culture that can offer them something. And uh, they don't have the same negativity, perhaps. Is that true? Well, I, I would say that I think um, you might call some of them naive or some of them are, you know, they, they really, the past that African Americans have is not the past they share. Right. But I think one of the things that became very clear is that even though my respondents are articulating the difference that they are Nigerian American or they are not African American like um, the native blacks of the U.S., one thing is clear, now that they are adults and they are in workplaces, they are experiencing discrimination as black people. So I think, you know, the story is not so much that African Americans are refusing to let go of the past, but that even as we have made progress, racial progress in the United States over the years and decades, there's still a lot there's still more room. We still have much more to do. And so, you know, I talked to my respondents who, you know, on the face of it, they are successful, they are college degree holders, they are professionals, they are lawyers, doctors, what have you. But when they go into the into the workforce, they talk about not having um, good mentors or not being as mentored and supported as their white colleagues. So they still experience some discrimination just because of the color of their skin, which is which is structural in in the United States. Well, there is still human nature, and there are still differences in people in their lifestyles and the families they come from and their cultures. Yeah. And there is just, I'm not going to call it so much discrimination as possibly just different people on different levels of awareness, some functioning at a lower consciousness, some at a higher consciousness. And as I say, I experienced uh, as a woman and as a Jewish person, I experienced discrimination, but it didn't stay with me. I didn't hold on to it. I have always moved mm -hmm. forward, and I have always yeah. uh, thought with great love and trust in people, and I want to think yeah. that way. Most people, many people, have goodness in their heart, and they make mistakes. So it's not just a question of Nigerian immigrants or black Americans, they can't focus only on their own needs and this separatism and this division. They, we have to start to think of ourselves as one humanity. And while we're living in the United States, one nation. And while we're in the world, one a global nation. And that's the only thing that's going to turn this around. We have to keep yeah putting out intentions for greater clarity 
and an appreciation and gratitude for what we have done. You can turn on any television, any show. Uh, uh, yeah, African Americans have integrated very fully in the last 20 years, and social media may be a big part of that too. Where social media has a lot of problems, it also may be helping uh, bring people to have information more rapidly so that they can see the whole picture, uh, you know, rather than one, one person's opinion at a time. Uh, but but let's yeah. let's go on for this. So, do you think uh, the African American problems, or even the Nigerian immigrant problems, are caused by external forces, or are some of them may be indigenous to their thinking or their culture? What do you think about that? You know, actually, what I've come to realize just doing my research is that. Um, I will take it from another angle. I think, you know, there's a lot more, as you have said previously, there's a lot more we have in common than actually what divides us. That's one of the things I realized as I was doing my research and looking at, you know, studies of people, other people, African Americans, children of Asian immigrants, Russian Jews, yes, yes. people of different communities and ethnicities. You could actually remove the names and, you know, forget the book in which you saw the quote, and it's as if you're talking to the same people. They have the same experiences. They have the same challenges. You know, they have parents who have high aspirations for, for them, for their children, though maybe the parents have different resources and ability to make their dreams happen for their kids. You know, and so at the end of my book, I do actually talk about the need to build bridges you know, which is right what you're talking about. You need to build bridges across the different groups to say, hey, there's, we have much more in common than what than our differences, right? And let's focus on that. So I do talk about the need for, you know, tighter for coalition building between African immigrants and Caribbeans and African Americans, and maybe we can start doing that in the schools at the university level. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know I started yeah. my career off as an elementary school teacher in the inner cities in New York. And all I saw in the children, because I was young then, was their beauty and enthusiasm. And I was teaching mostly African-American children. But I also mm -hmm. did come to know their families and the problems in the inner city and the solutions that are really needed now. And they've never really been addressed fully. Uh, I, I, as a single teacher and a group of friends who also were very interested in, in bringing, uh, you know, harmony and balance and giving these children a good education, right? Right. But we, was, we were hampered by so many issues, drugs and uh, illness and uh, lack of family structure and uh, par parents didn't even come when I had open school night and I didn't mm -hmm. have the support. So this is something that's still going on, still going mm -hmm. on in the inner cities, not in the middle class families. Many, many people have come in and, you know, merged into the middle class, but in the inner cities. And, and I want to help those kids. And those kids, the only way to help them is to give them a, a better education and communities that build better family lives. And like you are saying and I'm saying, bring us all together. When someone says yeah. something negative or hurtful, another person simply has to quietly perhaps say, oh, perhaps you don't quite mean that. You know, like in a little gentle way, giving them a chance to think about maybe what they've said, and maybe come to a different conclusion or realization. It's like working with children. Adults are not so grown up all the time either, right? They have their past childhood hurts and wounds, and they're carrying them forward. So uh, we want to get people uh, to think about setting the right example, right? right? This is a big word. That yeah. we're talking. Setting the right example, and I think what you and I are saying is, the right example is to get beyond our differences, realize why we have been so hurt, divided, and wounded, and just say, we're not going to allow that. 
We're just not going to accept that any longer. But let's go on to another question. Maybe this will help. What is a reactive black identity and black identity? I'm not quite sure I understand the difference. And why do these oppose success in the culture? And why do second-generation Nigerians go against this theory? Right. I, I think, you know, the theory itself is problematic, and that's what a lot of studies of black children in black families and black communities are showing. So the reactive identity or the reactive ethnicity was propounded um, with segmented assimilation theory, saying that when black children or black youth as a result of facing discrimination, their aspirations are affected, you know, they sort of become, you know, skeptical and cynical about the larger system and decide that they will withdraw from it so they do not engage in those activities that will promote good outcomes. So if they're in school, they will not answer questions or do their homework, you know, because they look at all those things as betraying their, their black identity, their racial authenticity. So that's what that reactive ethnicity is about, that they develop a strong identity that is oppositional to our middle class values, you could say, and that, that retards their progress. But oh. a lot of work out there has shown that that's not true, that, that black, black children and black youth hold middle class values and believe in education and in working hard. It's just that sometimes, uh, oftentimes, the resources on the ground to enable them to achieve their outcomes are not really there. No, well, that's what I was saying, uh, what I experienced when I was there. No, the resources weren't there. I mean, you can't keep children in school all day till 3 o'clock and then send them home to a family where there is a no cooperation between family members and there's no, uh, you know, the children are pretty much many times left on their own to survive. Right. And this is where right. the changes have got to come in the attitudes and, and structure of our families and our communities. And I don't think it's so much prejudice against a group as it is a group being steeped in problems not all of their own doing of course but still sometimes in giving up um, um, you know on forging forward with courage and with hope and uh, not letting anything stand in their way of um, Progressing, And there are people who can do that no matter what culture, no matter what economic level, no, mother, no matter what health situation. Yes, there are people like that, but many, many others succumb uh, to the traumas of these lifestyles. So uh, I guess what I want to say is here, I'd like to defeat this limited negative perception that is politically and culturally pursued. Uh, which is to continue to offer jobs, educational spots, and improve economic mobility while trying to move away from identity politics and separating groups from one, one another. Yeah, I want to get away from that. You know, you, you don't have to be in one group and one sport and one, you know, neighborhood. And the science of energy or quantum physics emphasizes the oneness and unity of all life. So I believe also more spirituality, more faith, more trust, but persistence, knowing science, using science, using everything at our fingertips together. But we can't ex exclude spirituality, which leads to the true nature of spirit and soul life. And it's the way past racial, religious, cultural, and national differences. And in my book, The Living Spirit, Answers for Healing and Infinite Love, I wrote, highly conscious human beings now and in the future are the templates for the evolution of humanity and for the creation of a finer state of harmony and balance. It will be in the sharing of our dynamic, beautiful, inspiring thoughts and in rethinking and reprogramming limiting thoughts that the shift will move us to a more productive level of thought and action. And that's, that's where we need to go. That's exactly... 
we are becoming more high, highly conscious human beings. We're all having a spiritual experience, uh, but some of us are resisting it and others are trying very hard to bring it to as many people as we can. So I think that's that's the way forward. It has to be both what's in the real world and what's in our perceptions, which are not always real, right? Some of the things well, people think. It, yeah, some yeah, of the... Yeah, I believe faith is an important part of people's lives, yes, and, and, and spirituality is important too, yes, indeed. All right, so let's get on. What would you like readers of the book to take away with them after reading the book? Yeah, I think, you know, one of, the, um, one of my objectives is to, is to make readers aware of the diversity of the black of black people, that, you know, black individuals are very diverse. And so sometimes, you know, this negative stereotype that many people have of black people is not a true reflection of what is going on in black communities. They are vibrant communities. They are middle-class black communities. They are black people who are doing well, who evince all that we know and say is good. And, and, and so my one of the things, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was just to let people know, first of all, shine light on how black diversity is playing out on the ground. Many quarters of the United States and also in Britain, black people are seen to be alike, that they are a homogeneous group, a monolithic mass, but that's not true. So one of the things my book is trying to do is to, is to broaden our understanding of the black experience in both countries and to show that there is an emerging and, and, and sizable middle class, uh, upper class blacks that are doing well. Um, so that's one of the, so to really chip on this negative view of black people oh, and this and view I, that black people are doing. And I thank you for that because that's what I have been trying to say. Yes, we have in this country had a great merging of people of all different races and cultures. You know, the other day I was watching something in St. Louis. They were having a protest down there, right? And I was just watching the people in the crowd, and they looked so alert, people of all different colors and races and race and religions. But they, they were all Americans, and they all looked how can I say, <laughs> you know, put together, responsible, uh, growing in appreciation, wanting to express themselves, uh, but not in a negative way. That's how most of the country is and most of the people. So I want to thank you, Professor Anaso Imowajin, author of Beyond Expectations, for your candid and appropriate look at immigration and the failure of so many people to move beyond the limitations of their physical ego-based reality into a clearer acceptance of humanity for all. To read more about the ethnic, racial, and historical concepts to improving awareness of second-generation African-Nigerian immigrants and other groups, go to beyondexpectationsbook.com. In summarizing this search into the feelings and needs of African immigrants and African American citizens who, like most people, are often wounded in childhood from traumas and lack of respect and kindness and often carry these perceptions and beliefs into their adult life, often causing economic, emotional, physical health issues, addictions, and through pain and blame of society, and perhaps family issues, often lose the momentum to reach higher for their own personal goals. But as we said today, so many are going beyond those limitations. So I just would like to say that we must not see ourselves as Nigerian, African American, or Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or any other group identity if it holds us back from knowing our humanness. I believe the hope lies in discovering our energetic soul presence and in that multidimensional condition, we are all equal. 
perhaps we should relate to ourselves as souls having a physical life here for the purpose of creating and manifesting love and compassion and not buy into the intellectual, ego-based labels and identity politics that cause so much anger, fear, negativity, and separate one person from another. I am Cheryl Glick, host of Healing from Within, and invite you to my website, CherylGlick.com, to discover leaders, authors who share insights for finding a more cooperative way to understand modern-day challenges and to find solutions to age-old questions. Who am I? Where does life begin? And what is life all about? Shows may also be heard on DreamVision7Radio.com and webtalkradio.net. Thank you.